Hello and welcome to another episode of Rustation Station. I'm your host, Alan Wyma. Today I have a pretty special guest, Daniel Tiberian. I hope I say that correctly. He is mm-hmm. the, I believe I can call you the creator of a uh, OS that's being written in pure Rust, which there's uh, quite a few out there, I think. But uh, this one is, I just, um, uh, yeah, it caught my attention recently. And uh, I wanted to have you on to kind of talk about the process because I think you're still early on, right? So maybe you can just give a quick intro about who you are and talk a little bit about Liberty OS. Okay. Uh, I'm Daniel Simbarian. I was born in Philadelphia. I lived most of my life in Pennsylvania. I moved to Armenia for a few years. Uh, son of a Christian missionary. Um, I moved back to America in 2016, I believe. Uh, moved to Missouri two years ago for college. And my second year of my political science major, I don't have a minor yet. I am a law school. I don't know if hopeful is the right word. I'm planning on going, I hope. Um, but I've always been interested in programming, um, for I think eight years now, eight or nine years it's been, uh, on and off. I used to do game development, but I've always wanted to work on OS dev. And at least at, when I started programming, I don't believe Rust was around any yet. I think it's like 2015 or something, right? Something like that. Um, but, uh, I recently discovered it. Uh, I knew of it left like six months, maybe. And... It was surprisingly easy for me to pick up, I guess, the basics. Um, I'm no master, but uh, I've made great strides, I think. <laughs> and this this project is, uh, I so I'd, I was working on my own uh, operating system a while ago. I was going to do a Linux distro uh, a year ago, a year or two ago. Um, that kind of fell through. And it also, it, I couldn't get it working. Um I couldn't get it packaged so that you could install on something. And also it was not really fun having something that wasn't mine necessarily. I wanted to make it entirely for all my own. Uh, there's an excellent guide by a guy named, I believe it's Philip Opperman, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, he's kind of, everyone who's done OS dev with Rust knows that guy. Um, he hasn't published an update to his blog in like two years, but he still comments on posts and comments and everything. Um, and he develops a bunch of, uh, crates that don't use the standard library because I'm going to get into this later. Can't use that, generally speaking. Um, but it's, it's, it was that and, and having a, a, he explains the foundations of OS dev and specifically with Rust and provides examples and gets you going pretty well. Um, and that seems to be the foundation of pretty much every Rust based operating system, excluding perhaps uh, Redox, I think. I think Redux, I don't know what's going on with Redux, to be honest with you. I never understood their, how they work, but it works well, I guess. How's that? Yeah, sure. Well, let's know how that is. It's your own story, right? So, okay. Uh, I mean, like, why would you have the interest to, to, to build your, your own OS from scratch? Because, I mean, it's a lot of work, right? I mean, Linux is not built in a day. Uh, as they say, Rome's not built in a day. Like, there's a lot of things to do, right? I think I saw... Recently, you're taking a look at writing to the screen, even like something like that, the 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 uh, screen buffer or something. What what was it you're working on? Writing, uh, I believe, it was drawing uh, images onto the screen. So there's a, right now there's a basic uh, thing in place to write text. Um, it's I'm, I've rewritten that. I swear I've rewritten that module like three times now. And every time I, I use the rewritten version, it's, it's something screws up. And so I have to go back and use Philip Opperman's written one as a stand-in so I can get it working. So that's what we're using right now. But I plan on, I want to rewrite it so that way it has more functionality. There's a great uh, crate just called Embedded Graphics. And it's supposed to allow you to render things like bitmap files and stuff like that and, and different fonts, I believe, to, to the... Uh, the screen and no standard library environments or no STD environments, as they would say. As we say on the streets of Rust, that's what I say. Okay, so I'm actually, I had a, a different kind of thinking in my mind that you're actually starting totally from scratch, like no helper libraries, but of course that would just be insane. Uh, so you actually already have some help when it comes to writing to the screen, right? You're saying there's already some crates out there that can help you with this problem. Well, to, for more, ex- so, okay, so there... It is from scratch. So we've never, I have never copied and pasted or one-to-one. It's not one-to-one. 
the only exception is obviously that that one module because it's just I can't get mine working and it's something so I can continue developing and come back and fix it. I've rewritten it. Um, I make changes and, and and I look at other people's stuff and try and figure out how they did it and try and reintroduce it or re-implement it because obviously unless I'm running one-to-one what they are creating, it doesn't work. But let's say that uh, another project has a good idea and I look around on, on forums and stuff or the OS dev wiki and try and figure out uh, how things work and, and then try and translate that into Rust. If that makes sense. But it, that, that specific crate is for extended functionality, I guess. So I can write text. I can write colored text. I can change the foreground. I've never done it because anything other than black for a terminal is horrendous. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It really gives you like, you get migraines and stuff. But yeah, it's just, it's, and at the very end of it, uh, the end goal I would think is, is to have zero external dependencies, to have everything rewritten specifically for the crate, uh, for the kernel rather. Does that make sense? But yeah, there's definitely inspiration and it's open source. And so we look at other open source things to figure out how we can accomplish certain tasks that we're trying to accomplish. Now, are you looking at um, creating all of your, like when I say not creating, but creating all of your things, like putting all of your stuff into different crates and then letting people kind of build off of your work? So was I looking into, um, yeah, so I did that before with a bunch of crates. So I was way before, I think this was before I really started working on the kernel. Um, I was working on rewriting things like bit flags is a popular one. Um, stuff like that and trying to get them running. The problem is I was still too new. I didn't know what I was doing. They compile their own crates that I owe. I don't use them. They're not good. We're still, I'm still working on them, but, uh, yes, I, I've wanted to, um, have, uh, I, I would package them up cause they, cause if we're separating them into crates, there's no real reason why you couldn't, I couldn't change the cargo, the Toml file and make it publishable. That makes is that a word? I don't know. It would also help too. So if you ever want to bootstrap some kind of installation and you want to, you could have a script that just downloads all the crates for you and sets up Rust using Rust up. Um, and that would make the entire installation process or building process into a single script, which would be very good. So yeah, definitely. And also it's, it's not fair. It's not fair to, to use others for inspiration and to take notes from other people and then not give back. It's just kind of messed up. You know what I mean? So. I had a, I had help from others, and it's not fair not to give back. I would help anybody if I could. I don't know what you need help with. If you want to write code poorly, <laughs> or, yeah, or you want to uh, have weird code that is not good with documentation, which I'm working on, I'm your guy. But <laughs> what, what about um, so so? Who's actually in the the core team, or do you have some kind of system set up already, or is it still really early on in the project where it's just basically yourself, and once in a while you have a contributor? So. Um, on the, so on the discord server we have, um, we have two or three people that are regularly discussing stuff and working on, on trying to get things working. Um, there's a guy named Jan, very helpful. I think he's Dutch. I think you were talking to Alan. Uh, he's, he's, he's very, very helpful. And he's, he's very, he knows a lot of people, which is good. Then we have another guy, it's Kepler something. He goes by Igor, or no, I'm sorry, he goes by Kepler's real name's Igor. Um, we've had two contributors other than me. One of them, their, contribu- their contribution was effectively removed because it was a change to a readme, and that part of the readme was just removed entirely. So it's kind of like it that didn't happen. But people were definitely working on it. It's just they haven't, like this Jan guy, he doesn't do actual, he's more of the, 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 uh, he does a lot more managing of the actual project structure and getting people in contact with each other and organizing things than he does actual programming. Kepler does a lot of uh, uh, graphic stuff. So he knows a lot more about embedded graphics than I do. I know next to nothing about it. Um, I spent most of my time, there's a lot of stuff to learn about OS dev and I've spent a lot of time reading about um, managing memory and handling different errors and, and working on different architecture architectures i guess uh utilizing every every feature that a processor has like a, a, everything that's available stuff like that but i don't know anything about embedded graphics so that's what he does primarily is that a good answer <laughs> did i answer your question 
Uh, yeah, actually. It, it, so it's still like, it's like less than five people right now. It sounds like, it sounds like about three max. Uh, at least people who are kind of contributing code. And then we have Jan. It's kind of helping to manage, which is, which is definitely something that you need eventually because it's difficult to kind of keep everybody in sync. What about, um, like, I, I'm just thinking about, like, when you writing this OS, right, there's a lot of stuff, right? Because every single... And there's a reason that we have drivers, right? Because like there's an abstraction and every single piece of hardware is is different how you interact with it in some kind of way, especially for processors, right? Each one has different uh, types of instructions. If you take a look at um, like there's risk, you know, the reduced instruction set. Uh, there's uh, 64, uh, 30, was it the 64, 86, 64, right? That one. Yeah. Like how do you handle this kind of stuff? Because that is going to be tricky. I mean, no matter what, you're going to have to drop onto some assembly code because you can't write. I don't think you can write Rust for everything, right? No, but um, with compiled languages. So f so about the architecture thing, there are different crates and different people who worked on writing Rust-based kernels and stuff for different architecture. There's a guy who did a RISC-based uh, one. I forget his name, but I have it saved somewhere. Um, Phil Opperman did 64-bit. Um, some people do their Raspberry Pi tutorials if you really wanted. So that would be ARM, ARM-based. I don't remember which which one it is. I think it's seven something. I think the latest one. But as for actual compiled languages, if you like, if you take GCC, which is the most, as far as I know, most widely used C compiler and C++ compiler. Um, I think it's hyphen S, I think, capital S. It, it, it will compile it to assembly so you can actually see what it turns it into. So you get a raw output as opposed to a, a binary or something. Um, so it, it, the, you're correct in, in that each processor is different, but as long as it can support the, the actual processor type, the, the differences between processors can be kind of made up by... Uh, compiler i would think for the most part but yes there would definitely be a lot of stuff to do that's that's why for example we haven't rewritten the some sort of c library or something like that that's because it would be such a of a, a monumentous monumental whatever the word is i made up a new word uh undertaking to write code for all different types of processors uh i'm just taking a look at like the targets uh that we have within rust itself like what are you targeting when you're building this thing? I mean, I'm guessing that you're probably using some kind of Intel-based CPU on your own machine, right? So are you just... The triplet, you mean? Yeah, yeah, there's a triplet, right? Because it's always a CPU-OS-... Dash dash, um, I don't know mm -hmm. what, what that is at the end. Um, yeah, so, so what are you targeting, actually? So the, the, the goal eventually um, is to... And this is not really practical because, like I said, we'd have to rewrite a bunch of C libraries, I guess, the standard C library, whether there's like glibc and musl, something which is kind of a gross sounding one if you ask me. Um, the, the best case scenario would be the x86 underscore 64 and then hyphen. I think it's, it would be none un, or unknown and then none, I think, something like that. Basically, as close to bare metal as possible. So as, as low down as we can go without, like we're not going to rewrite Rust for example, we're not going to rewrite um, GCC or whatever else, what other compilers we use to link in. Because um, if we end up using a lot more C or assembly or something, we'll probably have to link to some other compiler as well. Um, but yeah, it would, it's a lot of, as close to bare metal as possible. So at first I was really um, discouraged because you can't use the standard library, but you have core and this new update that will come out soon will be a uh, will add support for the the alloc, alloc, alloc. I don't know. It's allocator, which I don't know how to pronounce that. Um, crate plus with all the other crates that are available, um, stuff we've worked on. Uh, you can fill in gaps. Yeah, I was looking for the x eighty six sixty four unknown none, but I don't see that. I see unknown Redox, which is interesting. Is this unknown none? I mean, is that actually is it a it's hidden option or? No, it's not supported. So that, mm -hmm. my point is, so that would be the optimum, that would be the, it, so again, so because this, that, so what you're looking at are the triplets that Rust supports for compiling its standard library. So Redox has, they submitted a, a pull request, I guess, where they introduced 
support for Redox specifically. That's why they have their own triplet. But because um, they rewrote, I think it's relibc, I think. Can't remember. But so in, in order to, unless we want to rewrite it or uh, we'd have to either rewrite a C library or use some, some existing one uh, in order to have a triplet that's officially supported, I guess. You know what I mean? But in, instead of that, we're trying to, as much as we can, get uh, be disconnected, if that's possible, without being completely severed from everybody else. Okay. Does that answer your question? Um, it's kind of a... Yeah, because I'm sure people are interested, like, oh, if I want to do this, and then they might be looking in the targets, when you do target list for rust up, and it doesn't show up. So you actually have to do some, like, how do you actually install this target? Where do you find this target? Because it's not listed on rust up. Um, so there's a JSON file in uh, the the uh, root of the project's repository. Uh, it, ex it explains, I can actually pull it up here. It, dis it explains... Um, the target for LLVM, it explains the data layout, which if I'm not mistaken is, is type of processor, I think. can't remember exactly. The architecture, target Indian. I'm looking at it right now. It's on the thing. But if you look at it, it says OS. There's no OS. It, it, the triplet is unknown none. Um, it has some basic stuff so that way um, bootloaders can, can find it and, and know how to use it, I guess. Um, it's got a, a default strategy for when there's a panic on what to do, because you have to do that. Um, and you specify a custom um, target. So that's what we do. So when you actually build it, there's a, I believe it's in the, it's in a config file somewhere in the repository. I can't remember off the top of my head. It actually, it, it's configured so that way when it, uh, when you do cargo build, it actually references that JSON file as the intended triplet because it's unsupported normally. So it, it takes some, it took a little bit of, it's a little weird kind of having to duct tape things together and just kind of pray it works, I guess. But for the time being, I mean, it hasn't, that has never given me problems. The, the actual triplet has never caused me any issues. So, so what can this OS actually do at the current moment? Um, Cause it's, I mean, you said it can run in, in I don't know what we call that Q, Q, sorry, Q, E, M, U, and it's called Q, Q, M, U or something. But like, wh what can this OS do at the current moment? Well, so right now it's it's more I don't want to say proof of concept. It's it, not much is the answer in short. The more detailed explanation is, um, it's it's getting very close to being a really solid foundation for building upon for people to contribute and stuff. Right now it it, uh, it can print text and use different colors and it can you can write different messages. You can read uh, keyboard input. Um, you can make new lines. Stuff like that, but um, well, what I've been working on specifically is is getting it so that way it can uh, support crates that make use of uh, alloc or whatever, and then um, it it has its own memory management now, so it can kind of you can do more complicated things instead of just printing text because that's kind of useless. It's a word document effectively. Um, but the next thing up, the next few things we're thinking of doing. Um, is I was looking into how to write a file system. Um, that'll take some time to get working because I'll have to, you can, as I said, you can't use the standard library. Um, so I'll have to find some workaround um, first. Uh, I, I, I believe people have already done that, the uh, IO read and IO write stuff, but creating some sort of uh, place for this, the upper system to store files and actually be able to read and write. Because then you can write a shell, for example, something I want to do very badly. That's always been, I don't know why I've always loved shells to me. It's been very interesting. Um, and uh, I hope that Kepler will start working with uh, the newly added alloc uh, features to begin writing more interesting things to the screen, different colors and uh, perhaps bitmap images, stuff like that. Some animations, perhaps we can do some funny animations of Ferris. Come on, it's a, right. It's a Rust podcast. Everyone loves Ferris, right? He's cool. But uh, you like Ferris? Yeah, we actually just recently put a hat on Ferris uh, for for Christmas oh. for some for something. So yeah, we're all about Ferris. Um, it's better than Go's mascot. You seen Go's mascot? Yeah, yeah. The gopher looks like it's on some speed or something. The eyes are super big. 
dude, I would physically assault that go the go mascot. Is that too much? I'm kidding. But. Uh, it's, it's out of out of my my hands for that one. Yeah. Um. So the <laughs> what, what I'm really interested in is like, what about? I mean, it's it's interesting to see that Redux has their own kind of supported tool chains. Like, I guess that's also on your roadmap too, because you want people to write Rust programs for your Rust OS. So, do you have any idea how you can support something like that? So it's basically getting everything. So it's basically establishing the core functionality of an operating system, which is what I'm working on now. Uh, memory management, uh, uh, some sort of, well, uh, file system is another one. Networking is very important, stuff like that. Uh, a shell, once you get a shell and we have keyboard or, uh, keyboard support already implemented, then you can do stuff like a, a text uh, editor for the terminal, which would be very useful. Perhaps porting Git eventually, or some sort of stand-in version of Git. I know some people have remade Rust uh, or Rust version of Git. Um, and then with networking, you could theoretically edit things in the operating system and push them to a repository. But it's basically getting all those core features set up, just that way it all works, and people can begin working. Because right now, there's nothing really to build off of yet. We're getting close, but. Yeah, I think that would be pretty exciting. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm quite curious how you would support something like that. Um, like, what is like all the stuff you have to do? This, all this stuff seems like um, just way out there for somebody like me who's still quite new. But uh, yeah, I, I, it's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I, when you're designing this system, uh, I, is it going to be Unix-like? Is it going to be more Linux-like? Is it going to be some kind of mixture of the two? Like, how are you going to have this kind of cross uh, ability i mean like i'm guessing you probably want to be able to support people somehow compiling applications for your os um they're already written in c and things like that right so um i so of course based on what i understand of of uh the way different operating systems work my goal will probably be something kind of linux like which is itself unix like i i've always liked that um uh, the way that the terminal is a pretty important part of it, but you can not use it if you don't want it. Um, and how it's very easy to compile stuff, the file system on uh, and the structure of, of everything on Linux makes a lot more sense to me. Having a few different root folders and then those folders branch out instead of whatever the heck they have on, on Windows. I, I'm using it now and it makes me sad. Windows makes me sad. I don't like Windows. Let's move to something else. Um, Mac is good, um, and I would, I'm sure we'll take some stuff from Mac, some inspiration. I like their UI a lot. Um, and I think their, um, their in-house stuff is very good. So it's a bit of an inspiration to try and work on first party stuff as well while making it very easy to, to use third party stuff. Um, but I would think it would have to be something Unix like because the, the other, I can't really think of an alternative that would be viable and useful for anything you know now I, i'm still kind of i mean i guess it makes sense as a hobby to get into this but you're really planning on making some kind of daily driver with this os right i'll tell so this began as a hobby originally and my goal is the goal that i have now except i will have more goals in the future the basic thing that i want to be able to do is i want to be able to use this for stuff i do on the computer if that makes sense. That's my that was my hobby. The goal I had when it was just a hobby. It was I want to be able to write stuff for school. I want to be able to check the internet, compile things, program whatever, um, listen to music, whatever. Um, and I think that while that's a very it sounds like a pretty selfish goal, I guess. I, I think I'm a pretty average computer user, minus the programming, I guess. Um, so if I can if I can use it as my daily driver and it works for me, I think it would work for a lot of people because people, most people are not using like really weird programs and, and, and are, are working on like spaceships and stuff like that, like NASA or something like that. They're not really doing all kinds of complex computations. There, there are people that do that and there are a lot of people, but the general, my grandpa, my grandparents are not going to be, you know, Doing all kinds of weird stuff on the computer. I, I want to get the, the the functionality that you would expect from a average household operating system. Now, do you have a specific goal besides just? I mean, it could be just that, but 
when I go back to thinking like Linux, like they, they, I think they, I forgot what, what he wanted exactly, but he had some kind of specific goal in mind and, uh, that's fine. And Redox, if I, I think their goal is like, they just want to build an OS in Rust because I feel that Rust is such a great language. If, if I remember correctly, like your goal is just really just for yourself, just that you just want to build something, and use it every day. And it's kind of just your hobby slash kind of dream. Yeah. So like I said before, I was, uh, it's been years I've wanted to do this and Rust gives me the ability to do it. And it makes more sense to me now. I may, I'm older and I have more experience with programming than I did before, obviously. So I, uh, it's clicking for me a lot more than I'd expect it to. Um, and, and my, my personal selfish goal, of course, is I want to make something that's cool. I want something cool and I want to be involved in something cool. And I want to, <laughs> I want to share something cool with people. And I can't do it on my own, obviously. And I'm not Superman or Jesus or some other superhero like figure. <laughs> so I, I have to work with people and I, and I love them. They're, they're great. I couldn't do it without them. That's, that's the thing. That's why it's, it's, I never experienced the way that programming really brings people together and the ecosystem that I've never really been a part of a programming ecosystem quite like this. Um, and I want to work, I want to see how far passion for something can take people and how far we can go off of hobbyists and people who just want to work together and create something special together. You know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's kind of, I'm tearing up. No, it's a, it's kind of a, a, it's a group passion project. I don't think, I think if Redox can get away with doing it for nothing, for no real reason, I think we can too. Um, also, I don't know why I've never, so, so I've always thought it was interesting to see how far you could go without using the standard library. It's kind of a weird thing, but when I found out Redox uses the standard library and they have, they're officially supported, I'm like, ah, oh, that's not, now they're kind of like, they're part of the Rust establishment or the OS establishment now, you know? And I'm kind of like, ah, oh, that's, because that's, there's all the challenge gone, you know, because now you can just use everything. But then again, they've also been developing it for like a decade or something like that. So I think two months and making good progress is, is pretty good. But I want to have something that is unique and not just some other garbage OS that people push out for no reason. But what, how do you steer your decisions about what things to include, what to not include, how to implement certain things? I mean, do you have a the kind of idea where it's like, okay, this thing has to be fast or this thing has to be uh, modular or like what, what kind of design goals or design ideas or principles that you do you have when you're creating this? So originally it was whatever I liked pretty much because it was a hobby. Um, but as since it's been opened up to the public really and people have been joining and helping, it's become more uh, democratic. We we're actually discussing a structure and we were settling on, I think it was, according to Jan, it was a a three dictator, uh, theocratic, benevolent dictatorship. That's, that's a little redundant. That's what we're going to do. Either that or just a democratic type of, we vote on stuff. And we, because we, I think that's probably the best way of going, especially for doing a group thing and it's open source. You know, let people, whatever people want, they want. I know what I want, right? But I don't know what you want or what anyone else wants in their operating system. Obviously, I know what they don't want. And that's Windows. We use Windows as garbage. They also don't want uh, they don't want uh, a lot of bloat. They don't want stuff that really bogs their computer down. Um, with the way Rust is and and the way that the code's set up as of now, it would be pretty easy to port it over so that you could run it on uh, microcontrollers and stuff like that. Which for hobbyists and stuff, if you're using like Raspberry Pi or Adru Arduino, I don't know how to pronounce it. There's a little like uh, boards with like 16 megabytes of memory or something like that, you can have something that works and doesn't, you know, cause your thing to crap itself. You can run stuff with a very lightweight functional OS that doesn't really, doesn't cause you problems, I hope. So that's, it's kind of, we, we vote on it. We discuss it constantly, constantly. I, I wake up to like text in the middle of the morning and the, the middle of the night, uh, for people discussing like, I don't know what color the background should be or something, just like really weird stuff. I love it. I wouldn't have it any other way, but you should join anybody if you want.
come be a part of it. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of it. If you don't have like a specific some specific goals about it needs to be X or something, then you may start to lose uh, track and start getting onto the wrong path. Like, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of what 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 would make sense. Like, it, like I said, it has to be fast, so then that means that you have to just include the least and make it as lean as possible. But uh, but then you're saying you want it to be able to do whatever you want, but that is maybe too loose. I, I, I never built an OS, so I can't really say. I'm just trying to think about. Yeah, I mean, if you don't have some kind of goals in mind about this is what it is and this is what it isn't, that's why we have this and that's why we're not going to include this, even though this thing may be a good idea, but it kind of goes against the principles of the project. So we don't really want to include that. Like, there's no kind of like um, set rules about that at all. It's just kind of like, well, today I feel like, you know, building this or having this. So this sounds good. Uh, you know, I, I, I hope that doesn't come off as a rude or whatever, but I'm just trying to think about no. what is the the standards, right? It's it's basically uh, so that's why we have a guy Jan who does a lot of the management as of right now. Um, I can think up ideas and and start implementing things, but like you said, you start to get sidetracked, and then you also get it's very discouraging to see a bunch of unfinished things. I got, I got really bad ADHD. I'll go all over the place if I if I'm allowed to. So I need. That's why one of the first things I requested when I was talking to people on Reddit was, "Hey." We need contributors, especially someone who knows how to manage things like this. Um, I would think it would, if I had to guess, uh, my, my goal would be to have different stages, um, to set it up with, um, developing the core foundations of, of the, the actual system. So that way you can build off of it and have the things that you need in order to start really developing. Um, there's another group, another project we've been, Jan is trying to get us involved with. I believe it's Oslo OS. Um, theirs is so, while ours is more of a, this, in this, this, uh, crazy idea that is starting to come to fruition, theirs is a, they've done like mockups and stuff of a, of a graphical user interface for an operating system, but they don't know how to program. So, <laughs> so if we combine the two and they work on that and I work on the, the actual firmware, uh, not firmware, yeah, firmware, that's right. Um, I almost said hardware. Uh, I think that will work. We are, we're gonna div- yeah, we're gonna divvy up stuff to different people and have checks and uh, make sure that we're. I'm trying to write more notes and stuff and trying to keep track of everything. I'm trying to focus on one goal at a time. Um, I'm not spending time like I used to just implementing useless crates, stuff like that. Um, and as and I'm not trying necessarily to uh, make it as lean as possible. I just it would be it will be fast just as it is if you just don't fill it with garbage pretty much um it, it'll get you wherever you need to go but as long as you're not we're not filling with bloatware and stuff um and all kinds of stuff hog in memory it should be pretty fast and the about the microcontroller thing that i said earlier that would be uh some sort of separate project i would think some sort of weird port of it i've had an idea for a while i just don't know how to accomplish it yet i haven't really looked into it of a sort of build system that you can configure for whatever hardware you're using. So for example, if you want a full build or whatever, for whatever reason for development, I guess, I could build every crate we have. Or if you want some some bare bones one to use on some microcontroller or tiny computer or an old PC, you could do that. Um, compiled uh, languages are very, very fast. It's the compilation that's, or compiling, I guess, that's so difficult. That's the part where it slows down. Rust in particular, that's one of the downsides that I've, it's pretty much the only downside I've heard of is that Rust has a pretty slow compiler compared to other languages. I don't really know how true that is, but that's what I've heard. It's, that's the word on the street. I spent a lot of time there. You know, that's where I'm from. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't really know why that is. I suppose that could be the, the power checker or something that's kind of running in the background or, or running in the foreground, I guess, in this case. I'm not too sure, but I know they're making great strides and making it faster. I, I, it seems like every couple of releases they say, oh, yeah, we got 20% faster or something, which 20% here or even 10% here, 10% there, that's you know incrementally much better. Um, yeah, and then there's ways that you can kind of delay this, right? I think there's a cargo check command, which is quite interesting. So you can just check your work to see if it's working okay before you try to compile. You get halfway through and then it craps out, right? So cargo check can definitely can help your life. So I didn't know about that actually. I've so mine is small enough. I've only worked with small programs really. So I would just build it, and if it cramped out, 
it would take like 30 seconds and just die out. But uh, it, it's usually pretty good. It, it's compiler. Yeah. Cargo is just cargo. It's very, very useful. I mean, it's the best by far, uh, in my opinion, the best compiler there is. It's like, it's like a calm, it's like a mother figure or something. It guides me. It's very nice. It doesn't yell at me like GCC does when I make it. It doesn't have big, scary red letters that hurt my feelings. It's got kind of some red letters, but then it tells you, hey, why don't you? It says, like, consider doing this. I'm like, thanks. That's not sassy or anything. It's really like, hey, man, you should try this. Um, it's, it's, I think a lot of the slowdown is because of uh, checking for updates on crates.io. Um, if you start messing, as long as you're not messing with every file, it won't recompile the file. So it's only stuff you've changed from what I understand. So it should be as you run it more and it shouldn't need to compile everything again and it'll be a lot faster. But honestly, it's not that bad that I would not, that I would switch to some other language or that I would wish for a better compiler. I don't, I'm, I've never had problems with it. That's only what I've heard. I, I It's not very likely to me that something could be perfect. And so when I was trying to think of what problems Rust had, that's the only one I can really think of, to be honest. Um, so, so a couple of things. Uh, Cargo is, is, as far as I know, is not the compiler. There's Rust-C that's being called underneath from, from Cargo. Um, and actually, it's kind of interesting, too. I, I'm going to remember the people that built Cargo is actually the same people that built Bundler and Ruby, which is quite interesting. Um, and then um, what was the other thing you mentioned is uh, oh yeah, that yeah depends. I think part of that, um, I think that's a recent change. Like within the last couple of years, or even last six months, could even be where you have this incremental build where it's like they build every single dependency, and then if something changes, then you don't have to rebuild all the dependencies. Just mm-hmm. whatever you change, so that way you have that speed up. If I remember correctly, it used to be everything from scratch every single time. If I, I'm sure it must have been because it, it's a process, right? If you, you, but yeah, I mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, if you're working with small stuff, it's it's much easier. Um, yeah. So, all right. So it's interesting here, kind of where you are. And yeah, I saw the talk about Oslo OS. Uh, it seems pretty exciting. Uh, so Oslo OS, as you're saying at the time, they only have designs. They have zero code built. It's just nothing powering it, right? Yes, uh, from what I understand. I I've had to, I've been meaning to go back and read on the chats. Jan's been asking me to do that, but uh, it's finals week right now. <laughs> but I told him probably tonight I'll have to go through and join their group and, and read all this stuff. But what he was showing me was some like mock-ups, I guess. Also, by the way, uh, I, I forgot, I guess, about Rusty. Now, as soon as you mentioned it, I remembered. But I've just seen cargo messages so often that I'm like, oh, it's cargo. But uh, yeah, it, it's, it's they're more of a, more so than we are, I guess, a uh, idea rather than an actual product. So combining the two is what, the end goal will be. We have one of their members joining now. I forget what his name is. Part of it's in Chinese, I think. So I have no idea how to pronounce it. I just, there's only one though. There's only one user with a Chinese name. So we all know who it is. Um, but he was talking, he's from Oslo uh, OS. So he's our middleman right now. And we're trying, Jan's trying to bring in some of those people from his work or people he's, he's worked with before. We have different specialties and stuff. Because if we all have, if we have all me's, it's going to be crazy and it's not going to go anywhere because you need some other help. I can't do everything, unfortunately. Um, so that's what, that's why we have some very intelligent, very smart people. And I, I would love to, th- I'd like to thank them. Honestly, they're very, very, they, it's, I don't pay them anything. I hope they know that <laughs> I have no money. Um, and they're still working around the clock trying to get things going, which is very, I, I really do appreciate it. I just thought I would I would throw that in while I'm I'm on the subject. It'd be kind of weird not to mention them. I wouldn't be here without them. I was just taking a look at your code, right? And so I, I found something really interesting. So you have a stack overflow dot rs. I, I, this is inside of your test your test folder. So this is this an actual test case that you need to run in order to see if your things are working okay? Yeah. So those are test cases. There's a if you mm-hmm. run cargo test. As of last update, they're working. Um, there was an update that came out last night, I think, which. In hindsight, on a side note, I, I wish I hadn't made it a major release. I should have done 1.9.8 instead of 1.10, but whatever. Because this next one's going to be 1.11. And it's kind of weird not to have any sort of smaller patches in between. Yeah. Um, but those are test cases that will run. Those are supposed to test uh, different 
well, that one would be Stack Overflow. Uh, then there's one for booting. See if we can boot. Uh, test panic, the panic handlers and stuff like that. Make sure everything's... Basically, you're trying to make sure that the most important parts of the operating system are functioning as they should, which, as far as I know, they do. What I saw that was really interesting is that you, you have a... I don't know why you did this, but I'm curious about this part, which is this... Uh, one of them, you have a pubstern extern C. Like, why are you uh, exporting a C function in your test case? This pubstern C, and then it says the function is underscore start. Which one is this? Uh, so inside of the uh, the test folder. The step oh, it's in the, the boot mm-hmm. one? Uh, I'm not too sure what this is. Basic boot, I think. So I'm looking at one like that. That's probably because it would use the... Uh, it's using the boot image crate, which uses C and assembly in addition to Rust, mm. if I had to guess. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so it would use that. Because um, as far as I know, the actual kernel does not use C in anything. It, it would be the dependencies. I don't remember. I have no C left there. I shouldn't. I think I took it out. And the other thing I saw was was really interesting is that you have another function over here called extern, and I've never seen, I've only seen extern C. I've never seen extern x86 interrupt. So what, what, what does that actually do? What, how does that thing actually work? I think that's hardware interrupts. Is that what one is this in? Line 31 inside the same, the same file. Basic boot? Uh, this is still stack overflow.rs, one of the tests. Oh, okay. Um, so that would be, I believe that's, that's again, using the, uh, I believe it's, that's about, it's using hardware features, I believe, hardware interrupts. Mm. So it, okay. it's, it actually, it uses, uh, it's going beyond Rust. It's using, I'm still pretty new to this too. That's that's where uh, you start to get into C and assembly and stuff like that and mm. referencing certain features of the, the processor itself instead of actual, uh, like Rust, I guess. So it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of like, that's when you get into the really, really low level stuff, that's when you start having to refer to stuff like that. Because Rust just can't do it on its own. You have to have something. Or it will complain. It won't let you compile it. Yeah, I, I just never seen anything. I, well, I've never seen outside of C with, with this. So it's it's all new to me. And that's quite interesting. So it, your project could be interesting to people who are interested. What else? Check in. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it sounds pretty interesting. So I think I don't have any more questions for you about Liberty OS uh, other than you may change the name. So people should probably keep up with what's going to happen, right? Yeah, we're planning on changing the name because there's some other Liberty OS, which honestly, I, it's kind of hard to be upset with them because they had it first, but they don't use it anymore. It makes me very sad. I want to use it so badly. It's ca- it's caught on. We've already had commissioned. I've already commissioned like logos and stuff. Granted, it was for like five or eight bucks or something like that, so I'll get another one. But still, um, I uh, yeah, we we're planning on changing it. Uh, we talked about this earlier about something related to the the concept of being free from uh, surveillance and, and like telemetry, which is what they have on Windows, I believe, it reports all your stuff back, and which is not, usually it's not a problem. In, in, in theory, it's not a problem. Obviously, you want to help improve software when you can. So you'd want to report stuff, but it's when it's done like uh, without your knowing that that's the problem. It's, it's the, there's no problem with trying to, improve others code and stuff it's it's when they're st- it's theft there's a monetary value to your data it's not very high no offense but you can pay and take surveys and stuff and get paid for that that's one thing but it's just theft it's you're taking what little value and i mean little value one's opinion has and and what your experience would have and they're taking that and and making profit off of it which is just not right so we want to find something to do with I don't know, being independent and, and sovereign, I guess, which is the same word, but I said it twice, and they're big words, so they sound smart, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I don't think I have anything else to, to ask you about. I, I learned quite a lot already about Rust, and, and yeah, I looked at Core before, and Core and Standard, it seems like there's quite a lot of stuff you can already use that's about the same, but there's some things that are maybe too OS-specific. Um, that's what the Standard Library has that yeah. Core doesn't. And Al- the, the Alloc or whatever, those two crates... Mm-hmm plus some other crates, you can have effectively what is standard library just without it, if that makes sense. But it's possible. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to mention before we sign off? I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I suppose I think you already mentioned before you're looking for some contributors, right? Yes, I would. So if I had a clo- for closing, I'd like to say thank you for having me. This is my first time. I did a podcast when I was in high school for like eight episodes and they were terrible. So I've always wanted to be on one that's not terrible. And this is pretty good. I like this one. Um, be interested to hear you talk with other people. I'll have to catch up on those. Um, I want to say thank you to my team, the team that we're creating. They've done a very good job. I couldn't have done it without them. Um, I'd like to say thank you to uh, my my friends and family, more like my friend and family, my girlfriend, um, for giving me emotional support. Of course, thank you to God. I'm a Christian. I've always been a Christian. I can't do anything. I, I, I credit him for everything. Um, and if you're looking to contribute, um, we can't do monetary contributions yet. And I don't know what we do with it. That's another, I don't want to get involved in that yet. That's something like years ahead. So right now it's all work. So if you have anything you can contribute, even if it's an idea, just create issues all left and right. Just create them. That's so it's all right. Um, pay attention to the, the organization that we have on GitHub, specifically the kernel repository aptly named kernel um make sure you listen to every episode of rustation station am i right yeah definitely if you can check it out <laughs> if, it, if it's suitable for you see see i'm getting brownie points with the host exactly <laughs> all right uh thank you for for your time uh maybe you can reach out if you have some interesting updates that you think are really worthy to show uh especially if, if people can start to actually use it for some tasks could be good um, and yeah, let's see what happens for Liberty OS or whatever the new name may, may be in the future. Thank you very much. 